Hello to the Chicos and the Chicas. Round two, game two from uh, the Chandra Invitational. And we have got Drag, uh, also known as... I forgot the players. Is that Dan? Who is Drag? Yeah, Drag is bold move Dan. Uh, against... No, Dan is... No, don't. Sorry. That's chess aesthetic against bold move Dan. 2067 against 2061. Neck and neck in the... Uh, rating department and it is going to be the weirdo opening with bishop g5 and i was already mentioning in the chat that the best way to treat this for black is the shocking f6 move uh probably the only opening in the entire universe where on move two black's best move is to play f6 and the idea is quite cunning after here we go knight h6 and if white plays a lemon, then we go after them with knight f5, bishop g3, and pawn h5. And all of a sudden, it turns out that there is no adequate way to meet the h4 uh, threat other than playing h3, allowing black to completely mess up the pawn structure and play for a win. Queen d6, e5, knight c6, dead, dead, dead. Kill, kill, kill. Instead, we played c5, which is fine. But what is about to come is the greatest sin against humankind. And I love to emphasize this because according to the engine, it is the best move. And I absolutely despise it. So we took on d4 here. And my question is why? Why would you take this? Please, I beg you to tell me. Especially knowing... That after take on d4, we played knight f6. Which is always my mantra, by the way, that if we foolishly give up the center like this, trading this pawn for this, which is a crime against chess, and then you follow it up with whatever move, why don't you play whatever move without giving up the center? Why would you do that to yourself, young man? Why, oh, why? Please, folks, this is literally chess uh, sen understanding center 101. And I do get, by the way, that the engine wants you to take it. But there is a tactical reason behind that. And that reason is, is that the engine wants to play queen b6, hitting both. And this move is less effective without the capture because he white has an alternative move, which is to sack the pawn. Why is the C pawn better than the E? Because it's sitting in the middle of the board and this isn't. So the way how the chessboard is divided or laid out is, is that these are the central squares, yeah? These are the side central squares. Note how this is sitting in the side center. This is an awful bystander. Also, people do this trade all the time when the bishop is still here, which blocks that bishop in. So, yeah, that take followed by knight f6 makes absolutely no sense. None whatsoever, given that you could have just played knight f6 right away. Allowing the stupid capture here, which would immediately allow you to regain the pawn and play. Uh, why doesn't this logic apply in the queen's gambit? It does, actually. But there is an additional layer there, and that is that you get anchored play for that stock standard uh, minority attack. Having said that, the Queen's Gambit exchanged is supposed to offer you absolute bugger all hope for any advantage. So it does apply. <laughs> oh, that's rough, Rengal. All right, moving on. Take, take. Um... We took back with the E, and I told you that the engine is going to approve it, or at least it won't claim it that it's bad. But for the life of me, I don't understand why we didn't take back this way. Because after EF, now you are fighting with a weakness for eternity. And I find it quite depressing. The engine actually likes this position better for black. And I did tell you that... Um, in the analysis that uh, it will always find some creative ways to fight with the two bishops but uh, i don't know man it's rough going for sure i dislike this very strongly where does the king go if i take gf 
I don't know. Stays here. Where does they? Okay, so when, whenever I have this asked question that where does the king go, where does this king go? You tell me that, I will tell you where mine goes. Because if you tell me you're a castle here, I will tell you that I'm going to attack your king and likely I will go this way. If you tell me that you're castling here, I'm telling you I'm going to attack your king here and mine will likely go here. So when you are asking yourself, oh, I don't know where my king is going to go, I will go like, okay, where is their king is going to go? Because if you have a clear answer to their king and we still don't know ours, I will go like, fair enough. The engine slightly prefers EF, very marginally, but I don't know if I go in further depth, um, what would happen. But the difference is like 0.1. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, yeah, you needed to immediately turn on the heat because strategically you are clearly worse. Clearly worse. So you need to do tactical stuff to counterbalance that. But this is where we are absolutely removing ourselves from the realm of human chess uh, into the realm of La La Land because the engine's favorite line is Queen E2, King D8. And at this point, we lost touch with reality. A hundred percent. I do understand the move. It's simply to play bishop check and rook e8 to, to prove that this pileup is awful, which is what it is. This move actually punishes hardcore the check because now this is hanging, this is hanging, and bishop b4 check fold by rook e8 is hanging. So as soon as you see it, you go like, yeah, totally get it. Not a lot of people would come up with. Anyway, bishop e7, bishop here, castles, knight e2. Now we are getting significantly worse with black because we showed none of the tactical potential here and uh, d5 is going to drop out of the sky. That looked horrid and is horrid. The two best moves for white here are castles and knight c3. And I'm curious how this line goes. So castles, um, queen b2, um, sorry, castles, queen b2, queen a3, knight takes d5. And um, yeah, white has all the momentum. So that looked really great. Yeah, this is it's so weird. I, I wouldn't even play this move if it was good because it looks so ugly. Like that's where your knight wants to be, bro. Right? And also, bishop takes here allows very often black to cut your castling out. d5 is loose. It's like all kinds of bad on the surface. And actually, yeah, it drops like about 1.5 value. Hardly surprising. It's just an ugly move that looks really, really ugly. That was a uh, Hans Niemannism. And funnily enough, it's ugly. So yeah, it's, it was really unpleasant to, to see this move being played when white has, yeah, knight c3 and then castle and then take this. All right, let's go back. Yeah, white is still a little bit ahead here. Not anymore, though. C3 was needed. I did think that this position was... No, the Hans Demonism was a reference to when he talks about uh, the comparison of uh, the Jabava London and the French. And he says about 75 times back to back that this is a French structure and the black players don't like the French. And so we have a better French because of this is a structure that they don't want to play because... And he just like, it's an insane repeat. It really does look like he just, uh, you, you put the, the tape on repeat and it just goes in a never ending spiral. But actually it's him speaking the same sentence like twice, back, twice, 10 times back to back. Yeah. All right. 94, rook b1, 92, queen e2. And here... Amazingly, queen takes c2, which I thought was a blunder, is a clear advantage to black. What happens if I go here? Queen f5, keeping a tab on the bishop. Wow! 
That is beautiful. So it turns out that greed pays off. Means that queen e5 was played. Okay. So uh, the first thing that I didn't quite understand here from White's perspective was that why didn't we enter this end game? And I thought that rook b8 was better for black. And I did say during the analysis, but I didn't see bishop d5. And this seems quite sufficient to hold, actually. So that was a potential idea there. Queen f3, I suppose, had the attraction of, <gasps> excuse me, keeping the queens on the board. So we were all with that. Bishop g4. Uh, that was a pawn sack that we should have, could have considered accepting. And here now we are dead. Now we are well, like this position was like, G, G, we dead. Rook f1. Uh, queen back to c7. Great. Knight f1. Bishop, uh, no, we played rook eight, but bishop c5 would have been just as good. I have no idea what this move was. Like, that was one of the most baffling moves of the whole game. I guess you overlooked the fact that bishop takes cover the pawn. There is no other explanation. So, that, yep, yeah, that was a blunder. Knight e3, bishop e3, rook e3, rook e3, take, take, take. And here comes an absolute shocker. No less. We play bishop e6, rook d1. And at this point, you can play, man, what ever you want because white can't get out of this pin ever can't move the bishop because this is hanging and i can't move the rook because this is hanging so from here on out this is your ultimate ha ah, let me play 5000 moves before i decide how i kill you moment right anything at all b5 h5 f5 my favorite move that i told the chat was that why on earth are we not playing here f5 followed by take followed by take everything like this move in some ways and i hate to tell you this is the worst move of what we have seen so far today because this is the most illogical counterintuitive and offering the largest amount of chances to your opponent type of move in a position where you could literally just sit here forever like, none of these pieces will ever move for the rest of this game. That that was shocking. This capture was just really, really shocking. And f5 was such an easy move to play with takes and winning the house. So, I don't know what went through your head here, um, my friend. But that was just... Wow, man. Yeah, like, uh, that's a very good analogy. This guy is drowning and you just threw a rope for them. No, it doesn't because uh, there is a pin this way too, brother. So, no, it doesn't. But again, like, this is just a textbook case of us not looking into what the opponent can do. I don't understand your question, Yasu. What do you want to take with what, Bishop? What, what? Like, the Queen is hanging, the Rook is hanging, like, what? Yeah, this this was absolutely shocking. Uh, but let's move on. So we played Queen E7, King E7, uh, King F2, sorry. And now all you need to do is move this Rook wherever, and we are winning. And that was the second worst move of the day because that was virtually the only way to give a chance for white to stay alive. Every other move that doesn't take and does not blunder anything, like King F8 is 10 million times a better move than this. But Rook C8, yeah, like it is just, yeah, wow. That was absolutely surreal. Takes, takes, uh, queen c5 check. And even here, I think that the draw was on the cards for a very, very long time. 
So we came back takes, that was a bad blunder. And this is where things are going hairy for black with all of these crazy check shenanigans. Queen e6 is all right, check, okay. Queen f8, okay. Queen c7, okay. Queen check, okay. There, there, no problems. I don't understand why we don't check again. Like you really should have resigned yourself here to the fact that this has been royally stuffed up. And the motto that I said during the commentary, and I'm gonna repeat now, and that is why this was nothing short of a shocker, this move, is because in a queen ending, the number of pawns is almost always a completely ignorable factor versus the quality of the pawns. And quality of pawns simply refers to past pawns potential queen candidate. You, friend, have got zero past pawns. None, nada, zilch. We are two pawns up, irrelevant factor. Opponent has a past, dangerous past pawn, relevant factor. It at least cancels out the number of pawns. Like, I mean, you could have played for a win here if you hadn't played f5, to be fair, though, because king f8 and walk the king up here is a very easy win. Very easy win. Right? That's it. The textbook case, by the way, in case you really want to learn this from the classics, there was a very famous game between Marozzi and Alekhine, where Alekhine just kept on taking Marozzi's pawns in a queen ending. And uh, Marozzi wrote a very witty analysis afterwards about it when he said that, um, actually, if I recall this story, and I very highly recommend you, you look it up, it was actually an adjournment. Um, and Marozzi was the one to seal the, the move. And when he sealed the move, he wrote down that, Sir, when you took my first pawn, I was dead lost. When you took my second pawn, I had some chances. And when you took my third pawn, you threw the game away. And that just happened before Marotti's sealed move. And Marotti sealed the move that immediately secured a perpetual check based on some counterplay. Um, and that actually, yeah, is a very famous example of that. I should look it up at one point and uh, make another video about that. Anyway, so yeah, this F5 move didn't make sense and failed to do what was logical, which was to bring the king in, take the pawn and see ya. And then this shebang went down and now we are lost, actually. Because uh, with the king's help, the nursing of the pawn is no longer stoppable. And white played an impeccable endgame, by the way, just so that I say positives as well. Um, absolutely perfect endgame technique from white here on out. Actually, hang on. Yeah, this was suboptimal. Queen d5 is a good move here. Queen e8 check is a good move here. Uh, that was suboptimal, but uh, we rectified it here. Yeah, great. Queen check, king takes, queen c6. Very, very good technique by white. Very impressive stuff. Yeah, I really would like to pay my respect to White who decided that one point which was about here that he was no longer fighting for a draw but for a win and he had the cojones to play like that like there was multiple points where he could have bailed out with the perpetual this one isn't one of them actually but um, yeah it was just super duper impressive so congrats to Drong, and on that note, I am going to update the score again. But before I do that, we will thank the YouTube viewers for watching us. Don't forget to sub to like to send me all the love, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.